The presentation on gemstones of the Bible, especially the stones of the 12 stones of the high priestly breastplate in Exodus 28 and 39. Very confusing because in every English translation, these various stone lists, which I'll mention in a minute, are largely different. At least half of them are different in any random translation. They'll be very different in uh, four to six of them, different in every translation, no matter which one you look at. Uh, these are the stone lists in the Bible, Exodus 28 and 39, the high priestly breastplate. They're identical. Uh, Revelation 21, the foundations of the new Jerusalem in heaven are based on this list, but it differs. Job 28 and Ezekiel 28. Those are the five stone lists that are mentioned in the Bible. What do I mean by stone list? A list of 9 to 12 gemstones. We're talking what we would call semi-precious gemstones, which are prized, most of them, even to this day. There are also ancient Sumerian, that's the people of ancient Sumer in, the, in the, what we call Iraq today, and also uh, the Akkadian-speaking people, that is the Assyrians and Babylonians. They also had lists of stones, and that's a list of them there. Uh, various of them also. The Greeks and the Romans uh, had uh, commentators on gemstones. The Greeks, Theophrastus, talked about stones. And the uh, Romans, around the time of Christ, Pliny the Elder wrote his natural history with a chapter on gemstones. And all these I have used extensively to try to figure out what the stones are, not assuming I knew any of them, but looking in the original ancient languages to try to figure it out. Let's look at the first stone here real quick. In Hebrew, the first stone that is on the left of the high priestly breastplate, moving right, three stones in four rows on the breastplate, okay? First stone, Odom. In the Septuagint, that's what the LXX means there, the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, calls it Sardion. Sardion. What is that? Well, it comes across in Latin as sardius, and some translations say sardius for this. It's the same thing as carnelian. That is a red chalcedony, which is a type of uh, quartz. It's red quartz. And so the first thing you notice here is that carnelian is almost universally translated that way, except for uh, the ESV, which says sardius. Slight difference in color between the two in the modern day, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. What do I call it? Notice at the, at the bottom, ship. Carnelian, I agree with all the translations, but it's actually a misspelling of the ancient word cornelian, which is a red berry. Also, in Assyrian and Babylonian, this is based on a stone called Samtu, which means red stone. So far, so good. And there is an ancient carnelian, a red quartz, that, is, uh, that has been uh, inscribed. Uh, it has been uh, engraved with a picture of a guy riding, uh, I believe it's a camel, but it's a funny looking one. And this is an ancient, uh, from early, early centuries AD. Uh, this particular seal uh, that was uh, in, uh, engraved. Where did they find Carnelian in antiquity? Uh, Pliny the Elder, the Roman historian, says they found Carnelian in Babylon, India, Arabia, and Egypt. P.R.S. Mori, who wrote a book, I won't bore you with the details, recently in the last 10 years, says that ancient sources archaeologically they've found carnelian beads and other things cut carnelian in India, Iran, Turkey, Arabia, and Egypt. Well, some of those correspond, others do not. Second stone. Okay, so far so good. First stone, pretty much everybody agrees, red quartz. Second stone in Hebrew is called pitdah. Many translations translate this topaz, others translate it chrysolite. I'm going to sort of agree with the ones that call it chrysolite, but not exactly. The Septuagint translates it topazion, which sounds like topaz, but is not. Topazion means a place hard to find. <laughs> a place hard to find. And a stone hard to identify, I guess. 
in the Assyrian and Babylonian, I don't know. They're pro it, probably this, what is topazion in Greek, there probably is a stone that I'll get around to saying what, it, what I think it is, but I don't know what it is. I have not been able to run that down. The NRSV translates pit dot chrysolite. Oh, what's a chrysolite? I'll get there. The NIV chrysolite, the ESV, you know, more recent, topaz. The Jewish Publication Society Old Testament in English, the Tanakh, translates it chrysolite. And Ship calls it perido, also known as peridot, which is an American stone, by the way, a lot of it here which its modern way of, ref uh, a popular way of referring to peridot is chrysolite. Now, where do they find these stones? Where is, wh wh why topazion? What is that? It be it's because, Pliny says, the only source he knew of for this stone, topazion, was the island of topazios in the Red Sea which people couldn't, once they found it, they'd never find it again. It was hard to find. That's why it was called Topazios. Hard to find. We know where this island is today. It's called Zabar God. And in, in the Middle Ages, they referred to it as St. John's Island. That's a picture of St. John's Island, which is Topazios. And Pliny says a stone that was found there is the uh, Topazion, right? The Topazios stone. What he's talking about is not our topaz. Our topaz is a new world stone. It is found almost uniquely in North and South America, especially South America. Actually, blue topaz is found in Texas, in Mason. Blue topaz. Real topaz, it's extremely light blue, not gem quality. Also Russia. There in the Far East, there are sources for what we call topaz. That is not what the classical writers called topaz. What they were talking about is peridot, which is also known as olivine. Uh, it's uncut variety and uh, uh, not gem quality. It's referred to as olivine, gem quality, peridot. Why do I know this? He says St. John's Island is just loaded, or, or Topazios Island is loaded with this stone, and it is a pale yellow green. Topaz is never green. Our modern topaz, never. There's not a single that I'm aware of of green topaz. But peridot is always yellowish, greenish. Where do they find it? In antiquity. Pliny says Egypt. Pyrrhus Mori says Iran. Either way, you know, he, he thinks pitdoc comes, in fact, from the word in Iranian, pitta, which means yellow. Those, those uh, translations that call, top that call it topaz, as if it's the modern topaz, are simply incorrect. Chrysolite is a modern way of talking about um, peridot. Third stone, bereket in the Hebrew. This is easier than it looks, but translations get it fouled up. Look at this, NIV, beryl, NRSV, emerald, good for them. ESV, carbuncle. Carbuncle is a red stone. Carbuncle means red, hot, fiery coal. That's what it is. Carbunculus means coal, a red, hot coal. Emeralds are not red, hot coals. They're not red. They are green. It's a green barrel. Now, the Septuagint refers to it as smaragdos. The uh, Assyro-Babylonian is baraktu and the English emerald. And those are all related words. Bareket. Barak to Greek becomes smaragdos. They're all related. Believe you'll have to believe me on this one. And then smaragdos is in fact in German smaragd, and in uh, Spanish and Portuguese esmeralda, and in English emerald. You can see the the uh, the development of language which originally was bareket. It's an emerald. No question. It's an emerald. With apologies to, I guess, no one, the NIV and the ESV are simply wrong with this. They're simply incorrect. Did they do hard work? Absolutely. Are they people of good faith? Absolutely. Are they incorrect on the translation? Absolutely. That's an emerald. Like, emeralds are very expensive. They're probably the most expensive gemstone, more expensive than diamonds, to get a good one. Mostly they're found in Colombia and Brazil, some other sites in the world, but mostly uh, in South America. 
ancient sources, a lot, including Egypt. Both of these guys say Egypt. And in fact, up until the modern times, emeralds were mined in Egypt, easily gettable. Well, if you could find them. Scythia, Bactria, Egypt, Cyprus, and Mori, Iran, Turkey, India, and Egypt. A lot of people have said it can't be emerald because they were too tiny and could not be inscribed because they were full of inclusions and they were too small. Well, Pliny says, yeah, mostly they're small, but there are some bigger ones, in fact, in antiquity. It says that some emperors made like entire mirrors out of, out of emerald stone, out of smaragdos, okay? And in recent times, they have found enormous, huge um, uh, deposits of emerald. They're not great, but like 50 meters long by four or five meters wide of emerald. Not gem quality, but emeralds can get big. Of course, no one would want to get that and cut it for any reason. It's not good. All stones can be ridiculously cheap and all of them can be ridiculously expensive. It depends on rarity, uh, color, um, perfection, right? A lot of factors. All right, next stone, Nofik in Hebrew. Septuagint calls it anthrax. Heard of that before? Anthrax stone? Or just anthrax, it's an illness. Uh, anthrax means red hot coal. Uh, and uh, in, in Assyro-Babylonian, I'm not sure. I believe this is a reference to corundum. And the word for that in Assyrian is shamu, like the whale, shamu. That is, uh, corundum is sapphire and ruby. A ruby is a red corundum, a, a sapphire is a blue corundum. They're exactly the same stone. They're in, extremely hard. It's been known since way early in antiquity as emery. Okay, you all know what emery boards are? Emery boards are still used. That is corundum, crushed up, non-gem quality corundum, crushed up and used because it's awfully hard. It is the hardest thing they knew until Roman times. Roman times, they discovered diamonds, which they referred to, I think, as adamas. You've ever heard of adamantine? If you've seen uh, uh, Wolverine, okay? He had these things, adamantine skeleton or whatever. That's a diamond, okay, in, in Roman times. But it's after the time of Christ they discovered diamonds, and they were harder than emery or corundum. I think what we've got here is what, what I'll say in a second. This is crazy. NRSV turquoise, NIV turquoise, ESV emerald, good for them, Tanakh turquoise, because of because the similarity in Egyptian mefket, they thought mefket was the same as nofik in Hebrew. I don't think so. Was there, was there lots of tur turquoise in Egypt and Sinai? Yes, lots and lots and lots of turquoise to this day. And I've been to the turquoise mines, many in the, the Great Rift Valley south of the Dead Sea, Easily accessible by Egypt, lots and lots of turquoise. Is that what this is? I don't think so. Uh, ship, what does ship say? It's a deep red, beautiful deep red, hard stone. Turquoise is not hard. Garnets, spinels, and rubies are very hard. Have these ever been confused? You tell me. Garnet, spinel in the middle, ruby on the end. How would you know? And in fact, there is a beautiful big, beautiful red stone in the royal jewels in the Tower of London, right? Queen Elizabeth's jewels. And it's called the royal ruby or something like that. It's a spinel, it's not a ruby. But you'd only know by subjecting it to chemical analysis. By looking, they thought it was a ruby. In antiquity, they did not have chemical analysis. They'd look at these and say, carbuncle, anthrax, and carbunculus in Latin, anthrax, Red hot coal in, uh, in Greek, and I think that's what a nofic is. Uh, were these available? Yes, in all of these in all of these places, they were a little harder to come by because they're rare. Uh, garnets and garnets less rare. Uh, the rubies the most rare. Uh, the next one is the sapir. The sapir is looks like sapphire. And in fact, a lot of English translations call it sapphire because that's the Hebrew word is where we get the word sapphire. Is this a sapphire? No. A sapphire is a blue corundum, like a ruby, 
they uh, this is a hard call uh, ruby and sapphire were used to engrave other stones probably not themselves engraved and the stones of the high priest breastplate were engraved Septuagint calls it sapphiros, which is a cognate similar to sapphire or sapphire. In, a, in a Assyria, Assyrian and Babylonian, I think it is uknu stone, which is uh, lapis lazuli clearly. Pliny tells us what a sapphire is to, to, the, to the Romans. He knows exactly what it is. You know what it is? That lapis lazuli, it's a, a deep, beautiful blue stone with iron pyrite gold flecks in it. And there are many of these today. The, the best source for it is Afghanistan to this day. And it was in, in antiquity as well. Of course, the translations are split. Some recognize that it's lapis. NIV got it right, okay? It's lapis, it's clearly lapis. And those that say it's sapphire, I think are incorrect, uh, including um, the, the new Tanakh calls it sapphire. I don't understand that, so I think it's clearly lapis lazuli. The sources we have tell us what it looks like. The ancient and more modern sources, they all tell us what it looks like. Sapphires do not have iron pyrite gold inclusions in them at all. Sapphires do not have that. Lapis, to be lapis, must have it, okay? And ancient sources, Afghanistan, everybody agrees, that's where you got it. Russia, maybe Iran and Azerbaijan. Uh, they had ancient uh, trade routes where these uh, stones and spices and other things could be brought in. Next stone is the Yahalom in Hebrew. Septuagint calls it Yaspis, which sounds almost like an English word, a particular stone. Jasper. This is cognate with English Jasper and, uh, and classical sources. Uh, even, even the Akkadian calls it. Yash, uh, Yashpe or Yashpu. I don't think the Septuagint is right. I think this is the first time the Septuagint Greek missed it and uh, they got some things switched. And so there are reasons for that I won't bore you with. I think it is onyx. I don't think that it is jasper. Onyx and jasper are both varieties of quartz, different kinds of inclusions, so that is colors, chemicals that are uh, that are included. But notice what happens in the translations. Moonstone, emerald, diamond, amethyst. What should that tell you? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. This is my best guess. All these other ancient uh, stone lists include onyx, black and white onyx, and otherwise we don't have that on this list. There's another onyx on the list later, and I could have these switched. It's possible. Sardonyx is a red, black, and white onyx. And ancient onyx is not brown and white like we know today in Texas, a brown and white or caramel and white uh, banded stone that they make bookends and things out of. Most of those are not even onyx. They're mostly alabaster and other, other things that they call onyx for real. Onyx, true onyx, is black and white, black and white banded stone. There are a couple of kinds of onyx in antiquity uh, that are identified for us. Hulalu, which is black and white stripes. Papardilu is black with one white stripe. Then uh, the scholars say, but we're not sure. And I wish I could be sure. Uh, on the left there is the Hulalu stone. That's several bands of black and white. And uh, the other is a single band, Papardilu stone. I think that's what we're dealing with with Yahalom, although I could have it mixed up with the other onyx. By the way, I'm probably one of like two people in the world that's doing this. <laughs> so, kind of cool. So I need to run them down. And this one I want to do some more work with because I'm not absolutely positive. Ancient sources, they're all for, they all exist in Arabia, okay? And in India, mainly, those two places produced a lot of stones. The next stone is the Leshem, and uh, Leshem in the Septuagint is the Ligurion, or some translations call it the Ligure. I think the, uh, the uh, King James refers to it as the Ligure. Why? Because it didn't know. So it just made up a, a, an English word, Ligure. What does Ligurion mean? Lynx urine. Okay, that's what Ligurion means, lynx urine. What is that? It is a kind of sicky yellow color. Just use your imagination. Pliny tells us 
what a ligurion is. He tells us. He says it's a soft stone that's a sicky yellow, yellowish reddish color, and it comes from the Baltic, from northern Germany, and it often has insects in it. He tells us what the stone is. What is that? It's amber. It's amber is incredibly rare in the ancient world. Incredibly rare, even rare in the modern times. Most true amber comes from the northern Germany and the Baltic region. Some comes from Romania, and you have petrified tree resin. That's what amber is, petrified resin, tree sap. You have some non-amber tree resin from Lebanon. That would be easy for them to get. Uh, I think the Assyrian and the Babylonian is the Akkadian El Meshu, and I think that's where Leshem in Hebrew comes from. I'm the only one who says this. No one else has run this down. Two scholars say that El Meshu in Akkadian is in fact amber, and I, when I found that I went, I am justified. <laughs> Other people say everything else. Now, a lot of these guys call it a jacinth. A ja what is a jacinth even? It's in antiquity, it was a blue stone. Pliny says it was a blue stone. Um, uh, in, in Greek, it's wakanthos. It's not even ligurion. And uh, in, in the modern times, we think of it as a zircon. You all heard of zircons? Zircons are, uh, are a, a semi-precious stone. Some, some of them absolutely outstanding, great, wonderful, beautiful stones, but rather rare. And I, uh, even though they all agree, I'm standing in my own field and I say, hogwash, it is nothing of the sort. It is fossil resin, tree sap. That's amber. Now, in ancient sources, uh, in the ancient Akkadian, that is Assyrian and Babylonian sources, there is one that refers to the, uh, a chapel of the god Marduk in the heavens made out of the stone, and a lamp was made out of it, that because it is um, translucent. And in fact, this is a picture of the amber room in the, ancient, in the old royal palace in St. Petersburg, which the Nazis destroyed. I don't know if they took it away, they burned the whole building down, they may have taken it away. It has been restored. They've rebuilt the thing, is my understanding. You can check me on that. They have actually lamps made out of the stuff, and it's very translucent, quite beautiful, and quite soft. Ancient sources, Pliny says, he doesn't call it the Baltic, but Germania, northern Germania. And uh, uh, Maury says what I said about it. I think that's what it is. I am probably the only person who thinks this for the reason I think it. I'm going to publish this like that. Okay, so there you go. The next stone, the Chavot. The uh, Greek Septuagint calls it achates, which sounds like what you think. It sounds like agate, and in fact it is agate. Uh, in Akkadian it's referred to as shubu. The NRSV calls it agate, NIV agate, ESV agate, Tanakh agate, ship agate. Isn't that great? Yeah, actually the first time. The first one, Odom, the uh, Carnelian, more or less was the same. Sardius is, is basically the same as Carnelian. So, yeah, it's nice when everybody agrees. Uh, several scholars say, no, but that's what scholars do. They disagree. Uh, agate is a uh, <clears throat> red, red, brown, and to blue banded uh, chalcedony, which is quartz. They're all silicate stone quartz. Many of these are carnelian is quartz, amethyst is quartz. Uh, agate is quartz. A lot of these are different varieties of silicate quartz. It depends on the inclusion and the banding, what they're called. Onyx is quartz. And so that is your basic. Some colors may be rare. There may be some yellows here and there. Mainly brownish to reddish to blue. Uh, and this is a good example of that. Ancient sources. Pliny says that's ah, everywhere. It, 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 the source where it was originally called agate, Ahates, is from the river Ahates in Sicily. And he said, oh, people found it, and it used to be really, really expensive, and everybody thought it was wonderful, and now they find it everywhere, and so no one likes it anymore, because it's so common. So he says, we don't consider it important or precious anymore. That's like the modern day. Agate is so plentiful. Everywhere in the desert, you can walk across the desert and find agate, okay? I used to go agate hunting in the desert with my grandfather. 
Uh, and then Maury says, ancient sources, Iran, India, and Turkey. Why these don't agree, I do not know. Oh, well. Scholars don't agree with each other. It's what they do. Why we pay them. Aklama. Uh, the Septuagint calls it amethustos, which sounds like what it is, I think. Uh, and then the NRSV amethyst, NIV amethyst, ESV amethyst. Why the Jewish Publication Society has to say rock crystal, like quartz crystal, I do not know. Amethyst is a purple quartz. Rock crystal is a colorless quartz. That's it. Oh, well. And then the Akkadian is Hashmanu, I think. Uh, that was heavy lifting to come up with that. I believe that's right. I could be wrong. Purple quartz, amethyst, quite beautiful. It can be very expensive. Typically, most amethyst is a very violet, light violet that you get in jewelry stores, and it's not worth much because it's so common. It costs more to cut it by far than it does to get it. But there are extremely beautiful, deep purple, deep, deep, dark purple inclusionless amethysts that are worth their weight in gold. Ancient sources, Arabia, Armenia, Egypt, and Galatia says plenty. Maury says maybe Egypt. Maury, Maury's, a, I don't know why he's opposed to amethyst. I don't know why. Uh, so everybody but the uh, Tanakh agrees that Aklama is amethyst. The, the next few are going to be troublesome, problematical, okay? Tarshish, what does that sound like? Sound like a location in the Old Testament, right? Tarshish or Saul of Tarsus home in, on the coast of southern Turkey. My guess is Tarshish and Tarsus are the same place, a long ways away for them. A long way, like that's the end of the universe as far as they knew, okay? Um, maybe. The Septuagint calls the Tarshish chrysolithos, which sounds like chrysolite. Maybe it is. The Assyrian and the Babylonian, I don't know. I, I found a case or two where it refers in, in, that, in these, this, this set of languages to buralu, which I think is beryl. The NRSV calls it barrel. The NIV calls it topaz. Everybody wants to get topaz in here. New World Stone, sorry, can't be right. ESV barrel, Tanakh barrel, ship, barrel. I may change my mind. I may go with chrysolite here. The problem is the difference in color and hardness between a citron, which is a gold quartz, a barrel, and chrysolite, a peridot, slight. And in antiquity, they can look like the carbuncle, the anthrax can look very similar. And so many have noticed, you know what, it may have been that color and hardness, you know, uh, refraction was more important to them than, than other features because they didn't have chemical analysis. So barrel slash chrysolite may be the way to go. This is a heliodor, that is a golden barrel. You know barrel by other names, a sea blue, sea green barrel. What do we call that? It's the color of the sea. It's beautiful and very, very expensive. Aquamarine, uh, a light sea green, sea bluish green barrel. You know another barrel, a uh, deep green barrel. Emerald is a deep green barrel. Ancient sources, Arabia, India, all the, Iran, all the likely suspects. The Septuagint uh, Greek refers to the Shoham as Beirulion. There's a problem here. The previous stone we think is beryl, but this one is Beirulion in Greek, which is beryl. What's the difference between a chrysolite and a beryl? Don't know. I think that this is a banded red and white or red, black, and white uh, onyx, which is called sardonyx, and shows up in the Bible in the New Testament. Uh, NRSV calls it onyx, NIV onyx, ESV onyx. I think the previous one, Yahalom, was actually onyx, uh, black and white. This one, I think, is sardonyx, and in fact, some of the ancient Greek translations call this sardonyx. Uh, Tanakh lapis lazuli, no, no, I won't go there. Some, some version of onyx, and you have red and white banded stone is a Musharu stone in Akkadian, and then red, black, and white is the Lulu Danitu stone, and they get described for us. Why you wouldn't have a sardonyx on this list, I don't know. 
but you do in the New Testament have a sardonyx with foundation stones. And so I think that's what's going on. Could be wrong, but I don't think so. Ancient sources, all the likely suspects for an in antiquity. The last stone is the yashpeh uh, in, in uh, Hebrew, which is cognate with yaspis in Greek and jasper in English. Why the Septuagint refers to this as the onukion, which is onyx. I think the entire fourth row is wrong. Everything is a stone off. And the last line of this, the last stone of the second line is mixed up with the last stone of the fourth line. I think they met, I think the translator of the Septuagint messed up because every stone on the bottom row is off. All the other ones are dead on, I think, in, in the Greek. Look what happens. NRSV, NIV, ESV, everybody says Jasper because it sounds like Jasper. So why go with something weird sounding in an Akkadian Yashpu, okay? It should be, it should not be a problem, but, but it is. You all know what Jasper is. It is, uh, uh, of course, all stones can be lovely and expensive. Most Jasper is kind of a junk stone, uh, but it, uh, Pliny said yellow Jasper and blue and uh, blue and gray Jasper were highly prized. He only knew of blue Jasper and gray Jasper, so that's what I give you here. And that yellow was extremely expensive and rare. Uh, here are examples of all of them. We normally think of it as kind of a reddish, brownish thing with, with inclusion. Ancient sources, all the likely suspects. Here are the stones of the high priest's breastplate. In four rows, three stones per row, here's what I think. Carnelian, red, peridot, yellow-green, emerald, deep green. Second row, red, garnet, ruby, or spinel. Probably garnet or spinel, probably not ruby. Second stone, lapis lazuli, blue and gold. Third stone, black and white onyx. Third row, amber, yellow, yellowish or yellowish red. Agate and deep purple amethyst. Fourth row, beryl or chrysolite. Maybe it's just a brilliant yellow gold stone, like beryl is, like citron is, uh, and the other cases I gave you. Probably not blue, it's probably your yellow greenish thing. Sardonyx, red, black, and white, and then jasper. Okay, that's what I think. The stones of the, high, of the uh, 12 foundation stones in Revelation 21 agree, except there, there are some differences. It has sardonyx instead of onyx, which I'm very happy with. It has wackenthos, which is violet in the modern day, but was red in antiquity, considered red. And that is anthrax in Greek, which is a red stone. And then instead of achates, agate, it has chalcedon, which sounds like the city of Chalcedon, which is what it is. Chalcedon is chalcedony, which is agate. Agate is a chalcedony. It really doesn't disagree much at all, especially with what I've done to reconstruct it. But then the fourth one is just crazy. The Ligurion, lynx urine, right? Amber, not on the list. They didn't even necessarily know amber. They thought it was mythological. It was so rare, people thought ah, it doesn't exist. They replaced it with chrysoprase in Revelation. It's a green quartz. Maybe because its occurrence in some manuscripts of the Septuagint of Exodus 28 replaces Ligurion with chrysoprase instead. And then they didn't even necessarily think it existed because it was so rare.